I'm here with Ken Anderson um, from the Dana Farber Institute in uh, Boston at the National Cancer Institute's um, Symposium for 2012, where Ken has just given the Barts Cancer Institute lecture uh, describing his life's work on myeloma. Ken, can you tell us how the landscape of this disease has changed over your professional lifetime? Surely I will. It's been a great honor to be here, and I, I thank uh, St. Bart's for the ability for me to come and, and uh, share my story, but also interact with all the other experts from all over uh, the UK. It's been, uh, it's been a very special meeting. Um, for me, myeloma has been sort of a life calling. Um, uh, I've really been working at it since the early 1970s as a medical student. And over that period, the disease has gone from treatable initially with malphalan and prednisone in patients living two to three years uh, to into the late 70s, 80s, and 90s when Tim McElwain, among others, uh, did high-dose melphalan, first with marrow support and then with stem cell support. Patients lived after that perhaps three to four uh, years as a median survival. But what's been incredibly special for me and everyone else in this field is the last decade because we have an appreciation of uh, novel treatments um, that target the tumor cell, and the microenvironment, the proteasome inhibitors, the immunomodulatory drugs are the prototypes. Um, but they plain and simply work when other conventional therapies, high or low dose, uh, no longer are effective. And so what's happened in the last decade is we have eight different new approved regimens for our disease. Um, the numbers lag behind, but even the published reports document uh, in the test that the survival is two to three times what it was previously. So patients, uh, many patients with myeloma now have a chronic disease. And the one other quick point I'd make is that when we combine these novel targeted therapies, so with a proteasome inhibitor, for example, and an immunomodulatory drug, and use those initially, we now have the unprecedented situation where everybody responds. Uh, three quarters get a very good partial response and half get a complete response. So literally, um, in my lifetime, uh, it's been such an extraordinary pleasure to watch this evolution, to have played a part in it, but most importantly, to see the patients and their families benefit. Uh, it is extraordinary, they become our friends. Uh, and the personal and professional rewards are just tremendous. So one of the reasons that the landscape looks different is thanks to you, we're looking at it in a different way. And the tumor microenvironment has right. now become almost a more important target than the tumor cells itself. Right. Do you want to reflect a little on, on how that's changed yes. our approach? Yes, I think the microenvironment, um, or as I call it, the neighborhood, uh, has been important uh, in the biology of cancer, certainly um, for a long time. In multiple myeloma, we've been relatively lucky or fortunate because we can easily get bone marrow cells from patients and recreate models of the microenvironment as well as the tumor cells, perhaps more readily than breast cancer or certainly brain tumors or colon cancer, et cetera. So we've been able to understand the importance of the interaction whether that be cell-cell contact between the tumor and the microenvironment, growth factors, cytokines, chemokines, or other substances that are responsible for the homing, binding, and the growth survival and drug resistance advantage that's conferred by the microenvironment. And honestly, the eureka moment in myeloma uh, around the year 2000, really the late 1990s, was the observation that the proteasome inhibitors and the immunomodulatory drugs both actually work better against myeloma cell lines and patient cells when they're in the microenvironmental models, whether they be laboratory or animal models, than when the cells are in isolation, than when the tumor cells are in isolation. That's in marked contrast. There is what's called cell adhesion mediated drug resistance that completely abrogates dexamethasone or steroid activity and markedly attenuates alkylating agents, anthracyclines, irradiation, and everything else that we've done to treat multiple myeloma. But the new agents actually work uh, and are more cytotoxic uh, in the when tumors are in the microenvironment. And we and others have uh, 
really worked over the years to figure out the mechanisms of whereby that advantage occurs. And do you think those lessons can be learned in other essentially solid tumors that oh, depend yes. on the same signals? I absolutely do. I think there's a, um, a much evidence already in solid tumors for tumor promoting fibroblasts, for example, for myeloid cells, uh, myeloid dendritic cell uh, populations, for example, and other uh, accessory cells uh, that are going to be implicated in the stroma of virtually every tumor, whether it be hematologic or solid tumors, that are really every bit as part of the disease process as the actual tumor cell itself. Now, a large part of the, the um, advances have come from the wave of, of new antibody agents against many of the, the signaling pathways that you've elucidated. Uh, where do you see that field going next? Yeah, in multiple myeloma, we've been uh, looking for a long time for monoclonal antibody therapies. I, I was fortunate in the laboratory of Stuart Schlossman uh, way back in uh, the late 70s and 1980s early when um, monoclonal antibodies came into their heyday for T cells and B cells, first to identify uh, various lineages of normal cells, then to diagnose and ultimately treat uh, these malignancies. So rituximab, for example, um, is a blockbuster uh, successful drug in CLL and lymphoma, and I was honestly in the laboratory when B1 was produced. Um, so I have, a, a, if you will, a tendency or a need to find a monoclonal antibody for our disease as well. And it's not for lack of trying, but I can share with you uh, very positive news now that, for example, we found that a gene and a protein level an antigen called CS1, and the antibody targeting CS1 called elotuzumab has activity, primarily ADCC. When it's combined with lenalidomide, there's a marked upregulation of that ADCC, and we have clinical trials now where the majority of patients are responding to the combination of the immunomodulatory drug and the monoclonal antibody. Very exciting data now is emerging for humanized anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody, even in far advanced myeloma. And we've been involved in, in uh, honestly integrating two different companies, in fact, uh, to produce a CD138 that identifies syndican on all myeloma cells, and conjugating that antibody, CD138, to the metansinoid immunotoxin that has already been approved in the context of breast cancer. And we have early data now, but also very promising. The excitement to me of adding a monoclonal antibody is that the antibodies, whether it be a naked antibody or an immunotoxin, should be very effective, even in the context of the marked genetic heterogeneity, and in particular, the P53 deletion that occurs in multiple myeloma, some patients early, but in virtually all patients late. So many of the drug mechanisms that depend on P53 are no longer effective, whereas uh, monoclonal antibody-based or immunotoxin-based therapies should be effective. Some of the other agents targeting other pathways like the proteasome are now becoming uh, available in orally active forms. Um, that seems to be an important development for patients who are going to be on therapies for up to a decade. Yes, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, you know, we have um, history going back to melphalene and prednisone of oral agents um, achieving responses, sure enough. But what's exciting nowadays is the immunomodulatory drug class or oral. Lenalidomide was the original. Pomalidomide, a more potent derivative, is about to be uh, available. Um, we have proteasome inhibitors, bortezomib, which was intravenous and is now given subcutaneously, has revolutionized our treatment. We have more intravenous uh, proteasome inhibitors, carfilzomib is already here, but we have, as your question uh, so presciently asks, we have oral agents. So there's one called MLN9708 that we've studied in the laboratory and clinic, as usual. And in the laboratory, it's very effective, uh, even in bortezomib-resistant model systems. In the first man clinical trial, it uh, achieved benefit in the majority of patients. And excitingly, if you put uh, the immunomodulatory lenalidomide 
generic drug class together with this oral proteasome inhibitor, M1-9708 and dexamethasone, virtually everybody responds, and it's an all-oral regimen. Uh, this particular um, agent has a half-life of four to six days, so patients only take one tablet a week. Uh, very well tolerated. So, you know, myeloma is on the way to cure. Right now we're at the chronic disease stage. <laughs> but if you think about it, if you're going to have a chronic disease, the therapy needs to be very tolerated, preferably oral. And uh, so you can visualize that these uh, medicines could be given uh, as we like to say in the medical setting, as maintenance over time, if they're well tolerated and oral. And I do think we have both the immunomodulatory drugs and now the proteasome inhibitors to fill that bill. So following patients over time is starting to show us that the targeted therapies are chasing moving targets. Right. Do you want to reflect a little bit about how longitudinal sampling of patients yeah. with diseases like myeloma are going to influence the Way yes, no, that's a, it's a wonderful uh, question and it's, it's a very humbling to those of us who are trying to do science and take care of patients because myeloma, as other cancers, is a moving target. And we've had the privilege of working with the Sanger Center at the, in the UK uh, and looking at a very uh, deep level at whole genome sequencing and uh, looking at DNA, RNA, splice RNA microRNA and proteomic levels at what myeloma cells look like initially at time of diagnosis and what happens as the disease uh, progresses or in particular after relapse occurs. And we have a very heterogeneous uh, problem from the outset and it gets more confounded and more complex. Mutations come and go, translocations come and go, copy numbers change, it's really an incredibly uh, complicated and moving target, as you could so uh, correctly say. So to me, the implications are several. Um, mainly for those of us who care for patients, we need to understand the genetics as much as we can, as early as we can, and treat with combinations of therapies. I've already mentioned the IMIDs and the proteasome inhibitors and steroids, perhaps any an antibody. Other classes, the histone deacetylase inhibitors, I think particularly had activity. But treat, in other words, the pathways that we know that are abnormal and try to anticipate the pathways that are common for mechanisms of resistance and use that very early. And then from the comments we just shared, we now have effective maintenance medicines in my home. So get a complete response, hopefully at a molecular level, and then use the maintenance therapies to maintain. We can't, in other words, let these underlying evolutionary processes occur and which underlie and ultimately cause relapse. I'm afraid at that point, I really don't think it's a curable disease anymore. So the lessons are from infectious disease with HIV and tuberculosis and from cancer. When cancer has been empirically cured, childhood ALL, Hodgkin's testicular, it's always been combinations. We're just learning it more and more here. The second issue I'll just quickly mention to you is we need to manage expectations here because uh, no one is more optimistic than I. So uh, the personalized medicine trend that we're all so excited about, individualized care, is real. But as we are learning, the more sophisticated the genomic analyses become, the more complicated the problem becomes. And just to put it into my particular framework, we look at the tumor cell, which is what everybody's been doing, and understand how complicated that is and how it changes over time. But for my, one of my main interests, as we've talked, is the microenvironment. And I think there's no reason to think that the microenvironment has also not evolved over time, perhaps accounting in a major way for why the tumor cell changes occur as the disease progresses. So it's an exciting time. Personalized medicine is becoming real. We're going to have to look at each patient at each different time point. But I think we need to manage the expectations because um, the uh, complexity, I think, is beyond what anyone could have imagined. Dr. Anderson, it's been a terrific uh, privilege to be able to talk to you. With what you've talked to us about showed you've made some inspired hunches and guesses in your career. 
Um, here we are on November the 5th, the day before the presidential election. Do you want to call which way that's going to go? I really don't. I really don't. Um, we're, we are very hopeful that whoever our new leader is, along with my friends and colleagues and dear friends and scientists in the UK, that we can have the support we so desperately need from both of our governments to make science count for patients. You're not just a clinician scientist, but you're an eminent politician too. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Thank you. so much.